If you were not here on Easter Sunday, uh, we, I missed you, but I probably did not know you were here because <laughs> there was a lot of people here, which was really incredible. But on Easter Sunday, uh, if you weren't here, uh, the Israelites finally were delivered from Egypt. Uh, the story of Exodus is a story of God revealing his character, and in him revealing his character, he rescues his people, the Hebrew people, out of slavery and oppression in Egypt, and is bringing them in the future to the promised land, a place he has ready for them. Last week, uh, we saw that God sends his final plague on Pharaoh and the Egyptians, the Passover plague. And in the Passover moment, God saves his people, and Pharaoh finally relents and lets his people go. That Passover is foreshadowing the Passover where Jesus would eat with his disciples, and he would say that this is my body broken for you and my blood shed for you. And how the Passover in Exodus is God rescuing his people from Egypt, but the Passover of Jesus is Jesus rescuing us from sin and death. And that's exactly what happens when the Egyptians change their minds and they chase after the Israelites and the Israelites are stuck between the waters of death of the Reed Sea and the army of Pharaoh. But God parts the waters. He parts the waters. He makes a way through death and they walk through the path onto dry ground on the other side. But when the Egyptians chased the Israelites, the waters came crashing down. And thus the Israelites were free, and they had been rescued from the hand of Pharaoh. And on the other side, in Exodus chapter 15, they worshiped their God in the desert, which throughout the story has been what we're trying to get to, is the Israelites worshiping their God in the desert. And so now, they did it. They're out of Egypt. This is actually going to be our last week in the Gospel of Exodus. Uh, the book of Exodus continues on, and it's amazing. I encourage you to keep reading it. If you have any questions, let me know. If not, if you don't have any questions about Exodus, then I'm coming to you because <laughs> you are a genius. Um, so please keep reading. Uh, we're going to be switching gears into a new series, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But we're going to talk about the now What? They've been rescued from Pharaoh. They've been brought out of Egypt. And now the Israelites are in the desert, which is where we're going to pick up today. This is in Exodus chapter 15, starting in verse 27. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding any water. And then when they came to Mara. They could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Mara, which means bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. And he threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped near the water. Please pray with me. God, I thank you for your word, and I pray today we just hear from you, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember my first time reading the book of Exodus, and it's a pretty incredible book. It's an amazing story, and it's pretty thematic. There's a lot of these huge, amazing, mountaintop, epic moments. Probably the most epic moment of it is when the Israelites cross through the Reed Sea and are rescued from the Egyptians. And then there's this moment of worship, and it's just this incredible, amazing moment. And I remember when I first read it, I got to chapter 15, and then chapter 16, and chapter 17, and then for the rest of the book, the Israelites are in the desert. And I remember thinking, what 
what a disappointment. It just seemed like such a letdown. I was like, we're on this amazing story of God rescuing his people, and then they get rescued, and they just start complaining, and they don't get to where they're going in Exodus. They don't get to the promised land. They do go to Mount Sinai, which is where God gives them his law. That's kind of what the second half of Exodus is all about. But the first time I read it, I left feeling pretty confused and a little disheartened because like, what was the point of all that? They got out of Egypt, and now they're in the desert grumbling. And for chapters, they do just that. But right before all the desert stuff, there's this passage, which I just read, which kind of condenses the whole section of the desert into one passage, one section of Scripture that kind of summarizes what's going on for us. They come off this mountaintop moment into the desert. And you'll see deserts a lot in the Bible. They're kind of all over the place. And this is for a specific reason. Deserts represent multiple things in Scripture, but there's a few I really want to highlight. For one, they're in the desert because that's actually, (laughs) this is going to sound really dumb, that's physically where they were at at the moment. For them to get from Egypt to the promised land, they had to cross through a desert. So a part of this, by the way, as I talk, is just geography. They had to go through this desert. And I want to keep that in mind, that God didn't just put a desert there to be mean to the Israelites, but they had to cross through a desert to get where they were going. Deserts are like that in our life as well. Sometimes we have to cross through hard seasons of life to get where we're going. And we can't just stay in the desert. We can't just stay in the hard season. We got we to we gotta get through it. So for one, there's just some geography here. The other thing, uh, desert moments happen a lot in Scripture after those really epic mountaintop moments. Right after God creates everything in Genesis, uh, Adam and Eve leave the Garden of Eden, which is this kind of perfect place, and they go into a desert. There's a prophet, Elijah. Maybe you guys know this, this passage of Scripture in uh, one of the kings, first or second kings, where Elijah, uh, he basically goes to war against these false evil prophets of this God named Baal, and he destroys all these prophets, and he prays, and there was this drought, and then God brings rain, and it's this epic moment. And then right after that, the king and queen of Israel want to kill Elijah, and he goes to the desert. Or think about Jesus. Jesus gets baptized in the Jordan River by John the baptizer, and he gets baptized, and heaven itself opens up. The Spirit of God descends on Jesus, and God says, this is my Son with whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And how does Jesus capitalize on this momentum? How does Jesus, what does Jesus do with this moment? He goes into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights by himself. Marketing experts would call Jesus really dumb for for that decision. But Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights right after this incredible moment. Well, the same is true here, that right after this epic moment where God rescues the Israelites, they go to the desert. Now, the desert pretty much always in Scripture represents a time of testing and growth. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. It represents a time of testing and growth. So when I read scripture and I see deserts happen after mountaintop moments, I, man, I connect with that on a very real level, a spiritual, emotional level. I don't know about for you all, but for me, when I go through something really good in life that I had high expectations for, afterwards, I hit a desert. Not maybe a physical desert, but a spiritual and emotional desert. I remember the first mission trip I ever went on was to New Orleans uh, a little bit after Hurricane Katrina. And uh, I think I was 14-ish. And man, that trip blew my mind. Like, it was incredible. We, it was hard work. We helped a ton of people, met a ton of people, and it was just this amazing experience. And it gave me purpose, and we had this, like, really amazing team that got along, and we were just such a, you know, a unit, such a team. And then I came back home, and life was the same. And I felt like I had changed a lot. 14-year-old Schaefer thought he was about to conquer the world, (laughs) let me tell you. But everything else was normal. And there was this moment where, man, it was like, it was rough. It was this strange disappointment that everything hadn't changed. 
I think this happens sometimes with us, and sometimes it makes us jaded and a little uh, cautious to have a lot of hope or excitement for things because we're worried what will happen on the other end. But I think that the Bible does this in such a way because it teaches us, hey, sometimes after those mountaintop, amazing, incredible moments, we're going to hit a desert. We're going to hit those times that are kind of hard. I actually started getting in this routine if I went on a mission trip or any sort of church camp or anything. Of the last couple days before I would go home, I would just spend a lot of time in prayer and scripture and realizing that, okay, I'm going back, and how do I go back in such a way where it doesn't just floor me? Because ultimately, it's not the mountaintop moments that really matter. What we do in the mountaintop moments, I mean, that's incredible, and that's amazing. What we do in those amazing seasons of life is, is, is important, but what's more important is what we do after. Amen. What's more important is how do I handle the desert? Because the desert, and this is what the desert very much represents in Scripture, is a place of testing and growth. It's a place where God puts his people, or it's a place where God's people find themselves, and God uses it to test them and to grow them. Now, if you're in here and I say God tests us, you might just get a little, like, knot in your stomach or a little stressed or uh, maybe your palms start to sweat. We don't really like the word test, or I don't like the word test. I don't think anybody likes being tested. Um, if you are like me, it, my least favorite day in any college semester, my fa least favorite week, sorry, uh, was finals week, right? Uh, we have some college students, especially on the front row today, who are about to go to finals week in a little while. So please don't let this, just a reminder, guys, finals are coming. Tests are, tests are those, we hate it, right? Because it's like, okay, I'm either going to pass or I'm going to fail. I used to have a, a professor, an amazing professor, Dr. Gramling, who would say that tests are opportunities to show me what you've learned. It didn't feel that way, you know? It felt like this is an opportunity for me to show Dr. Gramling how bad I am at Greek. But Tests might give us kind of this like, oh, this uneasy feeling. But I'd also say this. This is not the tests of Scripture. These are not the tests God puts people through. He doesn't put people in bad circumstances because he knows they're going to fail or he thinks they might fail or like prove to me how much you love me. That's not the type of test God is doing when he puts people or when people find themselves in the desert. They find themselves in the desert, and God uses this as an opportunity for them to learn where they're at. That's what a test is, by the way. That's what tests are in Scripture. God knows our hearts. God knows our minds. He knows the Israelites. He knows where they're at and who they are. But he gives them tests, or he uses the challenges they're going to face as tests so they can learn where they are, where they are and learn how to trust God. I recently joined a new gym here in Brownwood, and this is not just any gym, because most people just say they go and they work out. But if you go to CrossFit, you let people know that you go to CrossFit. If you know anybody in CrossFit, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Landon, our amazing, awesome tech guy, who's, uh, he's, he's back there right now, one time he said something really funny to me. He said, you know Schaefer does CrossFit. You want to know how? Because Schaefer tells you he does CrossFit. And I was like, that's probably right on the money, man. Uh, but when I started doing CrossFit, this was a couple months ago, uh, there's this really amazing uh, coach there named Michael. He's awesome. He put me through a test when I first got there. It was this physical test kind of thing to see where I was at. I had to do like some pull-ups and some push-ups and some other stuff. And he put me through it. It's kind of this benchmark baseline test to see what I could do, to see how healthy I was. And then in a few months, uh, he's going to put me through the same test and see how much I've grown. And now it's interesting because before that test, I didn't feel super nervous about it. I didn't feel like, man, if, if I don't, you know, do really well in this workout, I'm kicked out of CrossFit or anything like that. I didn't feel nervous. I just felt, okay, I have to try and do my best here. And ultimately, at the end of the test, I didn't feel like I did very well. I thought all those rock climbing skills would translate. They don't, guys. <laughs> they, they don't, if you're wondering. Uh, and so I got to the end and I was like, man, I didn't do that great, but it wasn't a major bummer or anything. It just told me exactly where I was at and where I needed to go. Because that's what tests really do. They tell us what we know and they tell us what we don't know. Tests kind of reveal where do, I need, where do I need to grow? What do I need to work on 
in life. When we're tested in life, when we get on the other end, it's kind of humbling because we, we get to see ourselves for who we really are. Tests oftentimes show us our blind spots as well. I've been through a lot of seasons in life where when I get through some sort of challenging whatever it is, I learn a lot about what I didn't see. I learn a lot about the things that were just, I didn't think about, or I wasn't concerned about. When God puts us through tests, when God uses the deserts of the world that we're going to run into no matter what, God redeems those and he uses them as tests to kind of show us where we're at and to help us grow. Tests are a necessary part of life in moving forward and growing. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, and we're going to see that in this passage of Scripture. How is this a test, and what can we learn from the test the Israelites went through? Well, God calls this a test in the passage. I don't know if you saw that. So this moment in the desert is a test for the Israelites. So here's what happens. They leave this amazing epic mountaintop moment and they go for three days into the desert. Three days is a passage of time in the Bible you'll see a lot. And it it kind of, every time you see three days as a passage of time, it's referencing, numbers communicate a lot in the Bible. Hebrew authors would put specific numbers and things to, to communicate a message to us. So three is oftentimes a message of bringing from death to life or bringing something to a full completion. And so for three days, they travel into the desert. They're heading towards the mountain that God is going to bring them to to give them the law. They're in the desert, and it says that they had no water. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if I go 20 minutes without water, I'm like, oh man, I'm so thirsty, and maybe I'm dehydrated, and I need water. Uh, I've I've gone about a day without water before, I've never gone three days without water. I think it's really easy to judge the Israelites here, but let's just, for a second, real fast, this is a tough situation. The Israelites are far from home. They've left home behind, and I'm sure they packed water with them, and they brought water on the trip. But I'm sure every day that they traveled where they didn't find any more water, they probably thought, oh man, this is getting a little more scary. This is getting a little more intense we still haven't found water. And after three days of not finding water, I'm sure it was getting pretty, pretty intense. I think sometimes when we go through hard seasons of life, we might be, I'm quick to read the stories of the Israelites and be like, come on guys, why are you complaining to God? Don't you know he's got your back? But I think it's good just to pause for a second and say, no, they were in a hard situation. I think what we don't want to do with the Israelites, or anyone for that matter, who's going through a hard season, is to not give it credit, right? Because I don't want to go up to somebody and be like, hey man, God's just testing you. Like, this is just a season for you to prove to God and yourself how much, you know, how faithful you are. You know, maybe they're really in an intense and scary situation. And God, in this passage, does not get mad at the Israelites for struggling and having this concern of what's going to happen. Now, the Israelites don't do everything right here, but they were in a hard situation. And so for three days, they traveled without water, and it says this uh, in verse 24, so the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Because they'd finally arrived at a place that had water, but the water was bitter. They couldn't drink it. And so they say, and how, how infuriating is that, right? They get to a place that has water, but it's the water you can't drink after three days of being thirsty. And so they grumble to Moses. This is something that's going to happen throughout the whole section of the, the, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. They're going to grumble. That's the word it ch- they choose to use here. I talked about this uh, when I preached on the book of Philippians, this word grumble. This word grumble really means to mutter under your breath, and not in a constructive way, but in a destructive way. It's to mumble under your breath to kind of bring somebody down or something down. Paul says this. He kind of quotes this passage in the book of Philippians. He says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Honestly, I could just leave the sermon right there. (laughs) Do everything without grumbling or arguing. 
as, as followers of Jesus, this is, this is a goal of mine as a follower of Jesus. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. I'm pretty quick uh, to, to grumble, to mutter under my breath. I'm pretty quick to, to argue. I'm pretty quick to complain about stuff. And, and honestly, you know, we read this passage of the Israelites, and you might think to yourself, okay, Israelites, days before God rescued you from Egypt, he literally parted this huge body of water for you to pass through. He's literally been leading them in this pillar of fire through the desert. Where is your faith? Where is your trust? Don't you know God's got your back at this point? Don't, why are you grumbling? God is going to be there for you. You know it. Easter was last Sunday. Easter was on a Sunday, as it always is. And I I mean, what an amazing day, right? We, we are worshiping the Lord. We're remembering that God loves us and has defeated death for us. Like, that's huge. There's no better hope we could have as humans than to know that our God loves us and he's defeated death for us. So we don't have to be afraid. That's the best news there is, full stop. I'm pretty sure on Monday, around four o'clock or so, I found myself stressed, my mind very occupied with everything other than Jesus, upset, and probably grumbling. The day before was Easter. I'm quick to judge the Israelites, but I do this too. I'm pretty fast to forget what God's done for me. I'm pretty quick to go, man, that moment was awesome. The next moment, not so awesome. I'm right back in it. I lose the plot pretty quick. I think we all do. I think when we're in those desert moments or those moments of testing, it is really easy to forget the context or to forget what God has done in our past and have faith that he's going to do it again. It is really easy to just think, man, this is, this is the worst thing ever and it's not getting better. Rather than to, to not grumble and be a little more like Moses and just sit back and know God is going to come through. God's got this. This passage uh, in Scripture, this is a really cool quote that I read from a commentary uh, this week, that this passage of Scripture, this highlights man's innate tendency towards unbelief and God's ability to provide. Man's innate tendency towards unbelief and God's ability to provide. I would agree with this. I think I have an innate tendency to not really think about what God's doing. Why is that? Well, one, I'm a sinner. Two, there's a lot of things in this world that would love to distract me from what God's doing. But this passage also highlights God's ability to provide. Because in the passage, they're at this place called bitter. There's no good water, and they grumble against God. And here's what God does. Moses cries out to God, and the Lord showed him, this is in verse 25, showed him a piece of wood, and he threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. Now, this passage might look a little weird. Um, I used to camp a lot. I still like to camp. I don't know why I said I used to. Uh, I love camping, and when you go camping, you have to purify water sometimes, and there's lots of ways you can do that. I have never purified water by throwing a piece of wood into like a stream or something and be like, that'll do it. Uh, it's a little bit of a weird passage. Why doesn't God just clean up the water? Why does Moses not just touch it? And then the miracle happens. What's up with this piece of wood? Well, this is one of those moments, and you can look this up online so you know I'm telling you the truth. Uh, this is one of those moments where our English translations, which are awesome, by the way, our English translations rock, but it doesn't quite get us 100% of the way there. Because when Moses cries out to God, it says that he looks up and the Lord shows him not a piece of wood, but a tree. They translated it as piece of wood here because it looks really awkward in English that Moses would pick up a tree and throw it into some water. Like, that's just a weird scene. So, they translate it as piece of wood, which probably he breaks off a piece of the tree and throws it. So it's, it's still kind of there. But Moses is in the desert. He's in this place called Bitter, and he cries out to God. He's in the middle of the test. He cries out to God, and God shows him a tree. And this tree does something pretty special. It turns 
bitter water into water that is drinkable. Now, if you have uh, read the Bible before, you're a reader of the Bible, some of this might sound kind of familiar to you. One, this is the opposite of what God did in Egypt. The first plague in Egypt was God turned uh, the waters of the Nile into blood. And it says multiple times in that passage that the water was no longer fit to drink. It kind of highlights that. It's like, yeah, the water turned to blood and nobody could drink it. Here, God does just the opposite. God turns water that's bitter and bad into something that's drinkable. He turns something that's unusable into something that's usable, something that's bad into something that's good. This is what Jesus, this is what God does with our tests and our deserts and the bitter seasons of life, by the way. He turns them into something good. I'll talk about a little bit more of that in a minute. But also trees pop up all throughout the Bible, especially in turning points of scripture. Like this one, this is a turning point. The Israelites have been rescued and now they're heading towards the mountain of God where he's going to give them his law, his commandments. This is a big shift in scripture. Oftentimes in the shifts of scripture, there are trees there to mark the occasion. Trees kind of represent creation and God kind of coming together in these gardens, in these trees. In the beginning, God creates heaven and earth, and he puts two trees in a garden. One of them is the tree of life. This gives life to everyone. At the end of the Bible in Revelation, the tree of life is back there again, giving life to the nations. At the dead center of the Bible, there's a dead tree that Jesus is on, which is marking a huge turning point in Scripture. Or even Moses, uh, before he, is, he goes back to Egypt to bring the Israelites out of slavery, Moses is at a burning tree slash bush. He's at this bush that's on fire and it won't burn up. Everywhere where there's these important moments where things kind of shift, there's a tree. In every desert, there's this tree that marks a way out. God never puts us in any sort of situation where there's not a way to follow him and trust him. And every time there's a tree, it marks kind of a choice for us. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a second. But from this tree, God turns the bitter into something that's good. And so, the Israelites are rescued in this moment And God turns this place into a place, not of bitterness, but a place where they can drink water and be refreshed, a place where they can rest. And God calls this a test. This is really interesting. After doing this, this is what God says in verse 26. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I think what he's outlining here is at this moment at the the tree, he's saying, man, you guys have a choice. You guys have a choice. God is the one who heals us, but we can either accept that or walk away from it. In the deserts of our life, we can either accept that God is for us and that he's going to provide, or we can reject him and bail. In the deserts of our life, those are the most tempting moments to say, you know what, God? I've had enough. You're not really coming through for me right now. I'm sure if I asked for an amen, I would probably get some amens in saying that. But in the deserts, when we're at that tree slash cross, because the cross is is this dead tree, when we're at the tree slash cross in the desert, we're always at a crossroads where we can either trust God or we can blame God. God. There's this moment here where God's saying that this is essentially like a test. But there's also this moment here where in the desert, God gives them a massive break. He says, it says in verse um, 27 that God brought them to this place that had palm trees and 12 springs. Basically, all these numbers in this beautiful garden utopia that God brings them to, it's like this little pocket of Eden. It's this little pocket in the desert where for a moment, 
the Israelites are right where they need to be. There's this, before anything else happens in the book of Exodus, which mainly does not go well, there's this moment where God gives them a breath. And it's showing them, hey, it's going to be all right. This is where God is leading us by the way. God is constantly, this is the work of God. He's turning what's bitter into what's good. And he's turning the desert into a garden. But it's what we do in the desert. It's what we do at the tree and at the cross that really, really is going to matter in our walks. Because at the tree slash cross, there's always a choice for us. We have a choice of what to do. We can either blame God for the desert we're in, or we can go, you know what? I'm going to use this desert as an opportunity to grow. I'm not going to make this something that's bitter. I'm going to make it, or I'm going to let the Lord make it into something that's good. You see, this is... <laughs> This is always what we do. I think I'm quick to, in the dark seasons of life, to just let it be dark instead of letting God redeem it. I'm let, I'll let stuff like that hold me back instead of letting it kind of propel me forward because of what I've learned. At the cross, at the tree, in the test, we have a choice. Do I trust God or do I trust myself? Did I do what's easy for me to do? Do I go my own way or do I go God's way? Do I go the path of comfort and safety and easy or do I go the path of faith and that path of trust, knowing and trusting and hoping and having faith that God is going to lead us to a garden? That on the other side of this, whether it's on this earth or in heaven, God is leading me to a garden. At the test, I have an opportunity to trust God or to trust myself. At the cross slash tree, this is also the thing. We either make God into our healer or to our adversary. When we're at those crossroads, we either say, yep, God's to blame, or we say, you know, no, no, wait, hold on. God is my healer. And I'm not saying God is our adversary. God loves us, but we can make God our adversary. What I mean by that is if I view God as my enemy, in my mind and in my actions, he's going to be my enemy, even if he loves me. When I'm in the desert and I'm at this moment of choice in my life, I can either make God my adversary or I can remember, hold on, no, God is the one who heals me. God is the one who is for me and he's going to make it okay. Those are the options we have. I think it's easy to think, man, God doesn't remember me, think about me, love me, or it's easy to just not think about God at all when the distractions are really, really intense. There's this, there's this thing I love to do, which there's a sentence, I think I put it in there. When I'm in those hard seasons of life and maybe I'm mad at God or maybe I'm not even thinking about God, I like to say this sentence, God has my best interests at heart and I can trust him. God has my best. If you're a note taker, uh, maybe write that down. It's up to you. If you're somebody who self-talk is really important, like how you talk to yourself is uh, really how you think is important and you need to uh, sometimes interrupt the bad thoughts, maybe use this sentence. You can put it on your mirror or something. Sometimes when I say this, God has my interests at heart and I can trust him. Sometimes I don't fully believe it. Sometimes it's like 90% of me doesn't really feel that way in the moment. But 10% of me probably doesn't know what to think. Okay, 9% doesn't know what to think. And 1% maybe is really believing that. Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, it can move mountains. Don't think you have to be like a maverick of faith. Jesus is the hero. If you've got enough faith to like step on board, Jesus will fly, fly the plane, all right? You just got to get on board. So sometimes when I say that, God has my best interest at heart and I can trust him, I'm reminding myself of something that I'm, I'm choosing to believe. And then maybe the next time I say it, later that day or later that hour or maybe later that minute, the next time I say it, maybe I'm going to believe it a little bit more. And then maybe the next time I say it, I'm going to believe it a little bit more. It's this reminder of saying, hey, God cares about me. God sees me and I'm going to make it. I can trust in him. I think the story of Exodus is a story of people in 
suffering, but God sees them, loves them, and he's bringing it out of him, bringing them out of it. The story of our lives as well sometimes is that we're in a bitter place like the Israelites are in this passage, and God is turning it into a garden. But it's hard on that middle day. It's hard when you're still in the desert, and sometimes we need a reminder. We can either blame God and get upset, or we can choose to say, no, God has my best interests at heart, and I can trust him. Also, at the cross and at the tree, this is the main one, God turns deserts into gardens. God turns deserts into gardens. This is the, this is the most amazing one for me, that, that God can redeem anything. God redeemed me. God redeemed you. He can redeem even the worst situations, like the Israelites being in the desert for three days with no water. God is in the business of redeeming. See, this world we live in is a fallen world. We are sinners. God still loves us, and he's still coming through for us daily. And he's turning the tests and the challenges and the deserts into things that we can learn from, grow from, and will move us forward. And then ultimately, those moments in the desert aren't moments that drag us down, but we view them as gifts from God. God is leading us to the garden. There's a passage I love in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 17 through 21. It says this, You, this is Isaiah talking about Exodus, who drew out the chariots and the horses and the army and reinforcements together of Pharaoh, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, and this is God talking, see I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen. The people I formed for myself that they may proclaim my praise. I love that question God has for us today. Do you not see it? Do you not perceive it? I am making streams in the wasteland. God is always turning the darkness into light and deserts into gardens. This is what happens at the very end of the Bible. Spoiler alert. This is Revelation chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river, stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in his city, and the servants, his servants will serve him. What an amazing passage. That's the end of the Bible, by the way, guys. That's like the, it's like on the last page or the second to last page. God is always turning the bitter into the good and the deserts into gardens. Our job is to trust. Our job is to trust and keep following and going. And when we're in the test, not to blame God, not to be upset that we're being tested, but to trust him and use it as an opportunity to learn, grow, and trust. In this passage in the desert, God provides for the Israelites. He gives them what they need so that they can go forward and be his people. Next week, we're going to jump off that and talk about a new series uh, called Generous God, and that God is generous with us so that we can be generous with others because we know that we can trust God even when we're in the desert. Worship team can go ahead and come up, and I'm going to pray for us. Please join me. Lord, this morning, I pray that you would be, you would help us to be a people who, even when we can't see you, we would trust that you are there and you're for us. And God, I pray that you would just baptize our hearts and our minds so we would be your people and that we would know you are turning 
the bad into good and you're turning the, guard, the deserts into gardens. And Lord, that we would join you in that work. That's what we are as the church, God. We are in that work with you. So I pray, Lord, may your kingdom come, may your garden come in Brownwood and early in this whole area, Lord, and help us to be a part of that and to see what you're doing. God, I thank you for the tests in our life that move us forward and grow us and shape us. And may we never lose sight of you in the midst of it. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.